You probably uh, are, no fam- are no stranger, I should say, to miscommunication. Uh, you, you may be thinking uh, that you might have a gift at that sometimes, depending on your circumstances. Um, to really to miscommunicate, as I was thinking about this week, it's human. It really is. To, to be human is, in some ways, to miscommunicate, to miss things, to uh, misunderstand, even in the same language, right? We're not talking about a language barrier yet, but just in the same language, we miscommunicate, let alone <laughs> when there is an, a language barrier, uh, there's actually 7,000, do you know there's over 7,000 spoken languages in the world today? I don't know how they count that. I don't know how they keep track of that. Uh, I was talking to Rich Prohaska earlier this week, and he was saying there's around 350, if I remember his number, right? About 350 just in Papua New Guinea alone, just on that island. And that's not a very big island. Uh, you think about, we have, really have one in America, predominantly English, and yet you deal with 350 different spoken languages on one island that's certainly bound to lead to some miscommunication and perhaps tension. Uh, you, some of you may be familiar with archaeological finds that have cracked, like the codes, you could say, on dead languages or ancient languages, like the Rosetta Stone. You know, it's in one language that we know, and it's revealing another language that we don't know. Significant finds like that have helped break down the barriers of miscommunication, or even perhaps to cover up communication, you can look at things like the Enigma machine in World War II, or perhaps uh, I believe we use the Navajo language in the Pacific theater to obscure language and communication in, in order to communicate well with one another, but not enemies. You see those kinds of things. But perhaps maybe on a more serious note, some of you engineers or even others in the room may remember when the Mars orbiter crashed a few years ago. This was, this was several years ago. A Mars orbiter crashed, and that was a miscommunication issue. Not within the English language, but within math uh, language. One team in Colorado was working from a metric system. Another, do you see where this is going? Another team at JPL in uh, wherever that is, La Cañada or Flint Ridge, uh, they were using English or standard measurements in their calculations. So when it came to setting the proper orbit for the Mars orbiter, you can see where this went. A little, little bit of miscalculation due to some miscommunication saying, hey, maybe we should use the same math in order to land this really important uh, even it's kind of humorous, isn't it? You know, like a lot of sitcoms lean into the humor of miscommunication, right? Miscommunication between family members or neighbors that you see that a lot in sitcoms. And indeed it is humorous because there's something intriguing, something funny about people not communicating. Kind of like slipping on a banana peel, if that's your kind of humor. There's some kind of humor in people not communicating well um, because you see yourself in that, and you know at heart we are miscommunicators are ourselves. So to really be human is, in some senses, to be a miscommunicator. And you still have man today making attempts to miscommunicate. Most often not. No one seeks to be a miscommunicator. We seek to be understood, and we seek to hear well, but so much of our everyday life is really not able to achieve that. And so you still have man trying to overcome the implications or the fallout, if you will, from the passage that we're going to study this morning in Genesis chapter 11. So would you get a head start? Would you turn there with me? Genesis chapter 11 is the Tower of Babel. And as I was studying this week, some of you might be familiar with the app called Babel, which I find just so ironic that the app is trying to help you undo the effects of which it's named after. I think there's some high irony there where the app is trying to help you with communication and languages when God divided the languages in the nations in Genesis chapter 11. Today it's no different. We're still trying to overcome the 
barriers that stand between cultures, namely language that separates man from each other. But as students of the Bible, we come to Genesis chapter 11, we understand that God's our creator. If you believe the Bible, you believe that there is a God who created heaven and earth. Sin entered the world in Genesis 3. God judged that sin in a flood in Genesis 6. He restarted the whole thing with Noah and his family just a couple of chapters ago we studied. And we come to Genesis 11 and we can see how quickly things go off track with the human race. And we're going to read these nine verses in Genesis chapter 11 and see how even though man has his own ambition to accomplish his will, God's sovereign will will not be thwarted. So let's read Genesis 11, 1 through 9 together. Genesis 11, 1 through 9. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they they have all one language And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them from over the face of all the earth. Without this account, we would have no idea, would we, about how language developed. We can understand how languages develop over hundreds or maybe even thousands of years, but even In the same language, just take English, for instance, it's taken hundreds of years for that language to really separate from itself. Uh, Hundreds of years to really go from old English or original English to what we have in, in modern English today. Hundreds of years to develop that language. But here we have instantaneous language creation for the purpose of God, for Him to fulfill His sovereign purpose on earth in and thwart the attempt of man and his pride to do his own version of his own will. So what we're going to see today in this text is that man is rebellious at heart. We know that. But man's rebellious nature at heart, fused with his anxiety, cannot overcome, it cannot thwart the purposes that God has intended for mankind. We need to hear that this morning. The Israelites would have needed to know that going into the promised land. You think about why is this account here, and we'll we'll unpack it as we go, but why is this account here for Israel? They're a new nation. They're beginning really just a couple hundred years before this with their father Abraham when they actually are reading this for the first time. they're, They're still fairly a new nation. They're surrounded by pagan nations trying to understand how they might live amongst these nations. And God is giving first things to them, the book of beginnings, to help them understand the context in which they will live, the context in which they will be surrounded by a mixture of nations. And this DNA that you see at the Tower of Babel is going to be reflected in these nations that surround Israel pretty much on every side after they go into the promised land. So this is what they need to hear. This is what we need to hear this morning. Look at the the first thing here. We're going to see man's rebellion 
in the first four verses, which is really a mixture. It's a mixture of both ambition and anxiety. Man's, it's, it's his rebellion is a mixture of ambition fused with anxiety. Look at what happens here. Verse 1, simply, the whole earth had one language and the same words, meaning they all spoke the same thing, right? Pretty simple. One language, same vocabulary, no, not even dialects yet. They're all able to communicate, and it's smooth for the most part. And as people migrated from the east, or it, this could say, really, they're moving eastward, it's hard to know exactly where they came from. But the point is not necessarily where they came from, but where they landed, and that's, we do know where that is. It's in, it says right there in verse 2, it's in the land of Shinar and settled there. And really what this is, if you think of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers flowing out of the mountains and going in a southeasterly direction, they are putting Babel in that huge, really the eastern part of the Fertile Crescent, you've heard that term, the eastern part of the Fertile Crescent, and right there, not too far away from the, I wouldn't say the modern city of Babylon, but where Babylon would come hundreds of years later. Right there between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers is where they really found it's great to, for agriculture and it's going to be great for their endeavors. Look at verse 3. This is what they say when they gather together. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Sounds pretty innocent, right? It's not a, it's not a big deal where let's say, hey, come, let's, let's make some bricks. <laughs> you know, let's make, let's make some bricks. In other words, we don't have cut stone. There's not, there's not a stone quarry in the, in the middle of this land of Shinar. So they're able to harness technology to put together some kind of earthly substance, a raw material, mix it with this mortar, and indeed it could be useful for all kinds of building purposes. And you think about this is, this is quite the endeavor. You have to have a lot of people to come together and agree that this is a great idea, we should do this, we're going to have brick factories, we're going to have people doing this, we're going to do this for a whole long time until we have enough bricks to, we'll see what's next. Which is, it's, doesn't, it's not that big of a deal to come together and make some bricks. But look at where this goes very quickly. That would be one thing if we just had verse 3, but verse 4 really explains the heart of this text of what's going on here. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower. Even that, pause right there, even that is not the end of the world. It's not that big of a deal. Indeed, there has been cities built before this, even towers built before this. But this is where the text takes a turn. Let's build a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, or heavenward, and let us, note this, make a name for ourselves. Lest, here's where the anxiety comes in, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. That's really the heart of what got them together in the first place to make the bricks, to make the city, and to make the tower. Is it their selfish ambition to make a name for, ourself, for, for themselves. And I want us to see some of the keys here that show us this. This is really making a name for ourselves is exactly what it meant in Hebrew. It's to make a name for oneself. It's to build and allow the building to be what reflects not God's glory, but our glory. That's what, that was in the heart of this you, I wouldn't even call them one nation. They were just one people over all the earth coming together with this kind of ambition. Now, what they built had already been, in a sense, preconceived in their heart because we build what we worship, and once we build it, we worship it. Do you see the cycle? That it, what, it comes out in a sense of these, these selfish ambitions that are already pre-existing in the hearts of those who came together on this plain of Shinar. And so they, they built it. It literally flows out of their heart of what to build. And the purpose of the building is 
come, it's worship that would come back and fall on themselves, if you will. Self-worship, self-promotion. So they're not interested in making God's name great. It doesn't say, let's build a tower so that we might worship the Lord, worship Yahweh, or make a great name for Yahweh, but they're saying, let's take these gifts that we've been given, although probably not recognizing them as gifts at all, let's harness technology, let's take what we have been given tangibly and also intangibly, our skill sets, our minds, the giftedness, leverage this for what? to make a name for ourselves. Indeed, God hates this kind of behavior. He says that in Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 8. God hates pride. We read Psalm 115 this morning talking about not to us, O Lord, but to you and your name be the glory. But what we see here is the sinful DNA that's really unfortunately, still there after the flood. It was on the ark, it got off the ark, and a couple hundred years later, probably not more than that, we already have almost back to the same place we were pre-flood. Perhaps not as many people at this point, all one language, but it just shows how quickly the heart of man can swerve things into the ditch if God does not interject, if God does not come to save man from himself. As Romans 127 or 121 reminds us, let me read this. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. That sounds like the Tower of Babel. Almost that Paul could have had that in mind as he writes Romans 121. That though they knew God, they did not give God the credit. So what happens then? A, a new darkening comes upon the heart. But look what else is driving them. It's not just selfish ambition and to make a name for themselves. Look at the last part of verse 4 really quick. The last part of verse 4 says lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So in their ambition, as they seek to build, they're also seeking to preserve, to hang on to what they have built. To hang on, because why? Well, because when your identity is wrapped up in this thing that you have built, are you just going to walk away from it? Are you just going to, no, that, that is your identity, this tower this gravitational pull towards self-promotion is what you have here in the Tower of Babel. So you have these, this, this one language group coming together for this ambition to make a name, but not just let that name go. To make a name, what's the point of making a name if you're just going to dilute it and give it away? It's to protect it. And they have this fear that they will be scattered and in their scattering will be the dilution of their reputation, of their, of their name. So there's an anxiety and a fear that's driving this as well. So you have pride on one hand, fear on the other, coming together. It's going to cause you to do a lot of things. As one commentator notes, the hatred of anonymity drives men to heroic feats of valor or long hours of drudgery, or it urges them to spectacular acts of shame or of unscrupulous self preferment In its worst forms, it tempts men to give the honor and glory to themselves, which properly belong to the name of God. These things could be tangible, they could be intangible, they could be relational, they could be financial. Right here in this text, in Genesis 11, it's very tangible. It's making a tower. It's using bricks. It's using our hands. It's using our backs. It's using our minds. But it's also this intangible component, even societal component, that would say, let's do this because we want ourselves to be worshipped and we want to make sure that worship stays intact and we're not dispersed 
over the whole earth. And you have that, just that little phrase, dispersed, dispersed over the face of the whole earth. If that's what they're saying to one another, you could go back and look at chapter 9, verse 1, where we see Noah coming off the ark and what does God tell him to do? He says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and what? Fill the earth. Fill the earth. He says that again in the same passage. So here you have the, the same phrase that they are fearful of being dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And that should cause the reader to say, wait a second, that's completely contrary to what we had two chapters ago. So we know this team here is completely off mission from what God has intended for them and said for them to do. They seek to preserve themselves. So they're attempting, in a sense, to preserve themselves outside of God's stated plan for them. And unfortunately, this is not the only time you would see this in Scripture, is it? The nation of Israel is supposed to look at this and say, see, this is what happens when you do your own thing, when you go your own way, when a nation comes together to rebel against God. But unfortunately, you see this, you could call it mission creep, if you will, with the nation of Israel. Once begun by God, by the end of their, you could say, kingdom, they've 180'd on what their intent was supposed to be originally. Instead of worshiping God, they're worshiping the gods of the nations around them. One of the reasons chapter 11 is here for the nation of Israel is to keep them away from that, to see where, where man's pride leads him and what God will do with man's pride. You see it in the kings of Israel. You see it in the prophets of Israel. You see it in the priests of Israel. By the time we get to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, the whole nation, it says, is corrupt. And you had lone voices like Jeremiah, Jeremiah and Isaiah declaring the Lord's will even in that time to say to come back. So it's no surprise if you see it here in Genesis 11, you could say all those people came from Noah, right? And all of us came from these people here in the land of Shinar, do we not? Do we not share the same sinful, sinful DNA, the same proclivity towards sin as these people, certainly we do. And you see that today. You see that in cities. You see that in cultures all throughout history that have lifted themselves up. We saw that in Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. We'll read that later. But man, in, in this, to summarize all this, when man assembles and God has not intervened, man does not assemble to glorify God. The creator, does he? When man assembles without God's grace, it is not to worship God like Noah did when he came off the ark. It is to defy God and push back against him and his authority. But we have here Genesis 11. What happened just a few chapters ago? We had the flood, right? But God has put his bow in the sky and said, I'm not going to destroy the earth like that again. So what is God to do? Where, where do we go with this? If the nations are already in full, or I shouldn't say the nations, the nation, the one nation, is already in full rebellion against their creator, what is God to do? We'll see his response here in verse 5. Look at it with me. Verse 5, it says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. Think about that. That's not, that's not a mistake by Moses. The Lord came what? Came over? The, the Lord came across? No, the Lord purposely here. The Lord came down. It's this idea of him stooping and saying, Hey, what's going on down here? Like just this, this complete dissension down to see what man is tinkering with is the idea. The Lord came down 
to see the city and the tower. Anthropomorphic language, of course, God's not like unable to see from heaven and he needs a closer look. The idea is that God, almost like Abram and Lot, if you remember the situation where Abram meets with the angels and one of them is a representation of the Lord somehow, that's a little confusing, that's for another day, but he's coming to see the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to check out, if you will, he says the the outcry against these cities is so wicked, he's coming to check it out. The, the, The idea here is the intimacy in which God knows what's going on on earth. God comes down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. Another purposeful irony, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people. He restates what's clear in verse 1. They're one people and they have one language. And note this, God's observation here. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Think about that. God's assessment of mankind is is that right there in verse 6. This is just the beginning of what they will do. What's the beginning of what they will do? Build a tower unto themselves so that they might magnify their name and to throw off the Creator, to worship their name and to preserve their name completely distinct from God. That's what's happening in the heart of mankind, to cut God off and to exalt himself. That's depravity. This is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. God sees what man will do to himself and for himself without God's intervention. So you have next God's plan to come down and you could say punish and discipline the pride of man, yet at the same time, there's a hint of mercy of why he does this. If man is able to accomplish Anything that is, that, that's possible for him to do, when he gets together to do these things, and we know what we've already read, that God is going to disperse them and create languages, that's God's plan of punishment and preservation all at the same time. He punishes them in their pride by leaving off this self-exaltation project, yet there's a glimmer of future grace Because what is God interested in for these people that they don't even know about themselves? Eventually, he is going to set up, just in the next chapter, we have our father Abraham. And the the whole story, the whole narrative, narrative of Genesis shifts in chapter 12. And we really don't focus on the nations at all until what book? Revelation. Really, it's Revelation. There's, yes, there's the first fruits. You could say this is the time of the Gentiles, but it's not a focus on the nations per se. You could say it's more, more so an argument, a focus on the church that's calling out of these nations. But you see these bookends of Genesis and Revelation where God's dealing with the nations in 1 through 11. Then he focuses on Abraham for the next 38 books of the Old Testament, Abraham and his seed. And then through that seed that we're still talking about in the New Testament, which is the seed of Christ and the the Savior of the world. So this is where he leaves behind those who will exalt themselves against him and begins to call out of these pagan nations those who would live by faith. And Abraham is going to be the example and model of that. So look at, again, down in verse 7. Down in verse 7, God executes his plan. So he says, come, let us go down. The, nations have already, the, the, the people have already said to themselves, come, let us make bricks, and come, let us build ourselves. Now, 
It's God who's saying, come, let us go down. In, a, in, in the same kind of language that he would have used to say, let's make man in our own image. God have this inner Trinitarian conversation with himself, saying, let's go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. And you think, why is that a mercy of God? Why is that a mercy that God came down and created confusion? God creates confusion in order to create the dispersion. So the confusion leads to the dispersion. And in that dispersion creates the space for him to create a nation that is going to be blessed by him because his intent is to fulfill Genesis 3.15 where the seed of the woman would come to crush the head of the serpent. He's creating the space to create a nation that would be blessed by him, that would be... Remember what he tells Abraham, if you will, flip over to Genesis 22. This is good to note what's happening in a few chapters away. Genesis 22. And... Verse 18, we'll just, we'll just go to 18 and 19. We'll just go to 18. God is speaking to Abraham right after he is willing to sacrifice Isaac. And in 22, 18, he says, In your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Genesis 22, 18, And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. I would even argue that we might not get to Abraham if we don't disperse the nations and create enough insulation from one, cult, one sinful culture and another sinful culture. You, you know how this works. If, if, you're, if, if, the, if the monopolies, I don't even know when the last time the government really did this, but the government has the power to break up monopolies. Why do they do that? Because when you consolidate too much power, it's not beneficial for its citizens. So the government has that power to do that. And what happens when you do that, when you crack things apart, when you divide companies? It's the opposite of when you merge a company. When you merge a company, they have more buying power, more ability to take over markets. And when a government steps in and says, uh-uh, we're going to break this up, there's too few of you. So they break up oil companies or tech companies in order to benefit the citizen. This is, the, in a sense, that's just a glimmer of what God does here. It doesn't quite match the magnitude of what God has done for mankind to say, if y'all get together too much and too long, guess what you do? You self-destruct. In, in your climbing and in your building and in your self-exaltation, at the same time, the sin that's operating inside of you is destroying your chances for salvation. And God here mercifully comes down to confuse their language, so it splits them apart, and it says, verse 8, the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Now, it's interesting that they leave off building the city. The, the city's not destroyed. The tower is not destroyed. It's just they stop working on it. And there's this monument there that becomes a, a statement for the nations around to say what? That was the project. That, that's the monument now. Instead of a tower to ourselves, it all goes back to that moment when we were humiliated and we were dispersed and our oneness became diversified. So God, in His mercy, doesn't allow man to communicate in a way that would be towards this rebellious nature, in a sense, too soon for God to implement His sovereign plan. And He does that 
out of his kindness and mercy. I'm trying to think about, like, I think that's funny. When you go home, you go to sleep, and you wake up the next day, and you're talking a different language. Like, you go back to work. Can you imagine that? Like, you go home, you, you, you fall asleep, you wake up, you're speaking something else. You don't even know you're speaking it. You just think you're speaking the same, la- I think you're speaking the same language. Uh, that, that's how I'm imagining it. <laughs> you're, you're trying to communicate. And what do we do when we don't know the other person's language or they don't know our language? What do we do? We like repeat. We raise our voice. We speak our same language louder at them. We point a lot or try to describe with our hands or our, our body in some way that would overcome that language barrier. And you could see how difficult a building project would be. You can see, you can see that, right? I think that's funny. I think they go back to the same thing. They don't know it yet. They're like, hey, pass me that. You know, like, what? And so they're just like all this constant miscommunication. You could say, sure, they could overcome that. They could write languages, really. They could, they could power through that. No. Like, I think the, the heartbeat was just ripped out from their ambition be like, this is ridiculous. I can't even communicate with the people around me. So in time, God uses this confusion to disperse them all over what would be the world at that time. That is his future grace to them. And this is really an example. You look at the, the, the end here, 11, 1 through 9. Look at verse 9. Just a summary statement by Moses. He says, Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused, and that word, you see it in some of your footnotes, that that word confused sounds, it's Belel in Hebrew, so it, it's kind of a word play. It's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. That helps Israel profoundly to understand their context. You understand that? If you didn't know that and you're a young nation going to cross into the promised land, you're just trying to figure out what's happening around you, but God has given them the historical context of what has happened so that they might know how to worship him. And what are they supposed to see here in Babel? I think one thing you see is that what the people feared, this dispersion, They feared, and guess what? Their fears came to become prophecy. What they feared came to pass. Hey, we're going to get together to retain this. We're going to keep this together, and God says, "Uh uh-uh. So in their oneness and their cohesion and their seeking to make a name for themselves, God splits that apart, and in the end, they get what they fear. Another thing is just that wordplay that's already been then mentioned Babel and Balel. So every time the Hebrews would mention that, they could think back to saying, oh, that, yeah, that's that example. That's when God divided the tongues. That's that tower that's still over there left off from the work. It's still a monument to man's lack of achievement over God. And then finally, the context for the Israelite would, would have to take to heart and understand and say to himself, this is what happens to nations that come together and try to overthrow the Creator. Would they, they, they've seen so far that Eve sought to do that, to reach out, to grab the apple. I just made that up. Apple, still in my Sunday school uh, stories. Reach out and grab the fruit and partake in, in Adam with her. They saw in Cain doing his own thing. They saw it in all these people doing their own thing and not listening to the preaching of Noah. So would they seek God's glory or would they grasp for, grasp for their own? I think that's what the Hebrews are meant to see here and what we're meant to see as well. Would they grasp for it or would they trust in God to provide it? And we have to ask ourselves that quite same question, right? You can see the lesson on the text. You can see the application. But yes, this is a one language group coming together. But if that, if that 
cohesive unit represented all mankind that would come from their offspring, then certainly we share the same DNA. Certainly we can understand that depravity means we have a a leaning towards sinfulness. And what is sinfulness other than self-promotion, trying to exalt ourselves above God? Every time we sin, we're making a declaration that we would like to be above God and God's law. But this is where the gospel comes in, is it not? God inserts His sovereign hand And and you think about how did he do that? We don't really know. He just simply, instead of one language, it's likely that it's around 70 languages. Instantaneously, overnight, God creates language. Many, many languages that would confuse these nations. And you see that God, this is God's grace to a rebellious world. I'm going to insert myself, I'm going to, you could say, reassert Even though he's always sovereign, God's going to act in this moment. Why? To preserve man from self-destruction. Man's ambitious pride and his insecurity lead him towards these kinds of projects, if you will, to exalt his own name. And God is saying, you'll never find happiness. You'll never find security. You'll never find joy and building towers for your own name. I don't think that's a stretch on this text. Certainly, as nations come together and compound sin, compound and be more creative with evil, you can see the potential for that. And as nations become more powerful and more centralized, you're going to see this probably until the Lord returns. But this is God's grace in saying, I'm not going to let man thwart the plan of salvation that would save him from himself. And this is a lesson we need to learn just as Israel did. There's not happiness in self-glorification. But there's a lie there, isn't it? There's always that lie that if you promote self, if you chase self, If you chase perhaps anything or anyone, whether it's tangible or intangible, it could be societal, it could be relational, it could be financial, it could be spiritual. You chase that thing to get you what? To get you elevation. There's a lie there that says, once I get that, I will be happy, I'll be joyful, I'll be content. Um, But this never of course, pleases the God who is the creator of all. I think there's a couple of of walkaway lessons I want to show us here for, for Israel, for the nations, and for us, but also what it says about our God. We've already talked about Israel a little bit. But this 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 account would have played a profound role in her orientation. Remember how God says later to Israel to not observe or not be curious or not go after the gods of the nations that were around Israel. If you remember what he says to them, especially in Deuteronomy, he says, you're going to go into this land and don't chase the gods of the nations around you. Don't intermarry with them lest they steal your heart away. Is this, is this what God warns him? And he also says, and when you, if and when you do, he's going to use those same nations to what for Israel? To discipline them. I think that's, that's so ironic that he said, don't chase those nations. And if you do, that's kind of what we read in Psalm 115. Those things come back and fall upon us. If you want those nations... I'm going to use those nations to discipline you. And then when those nations get proud, we see this with Babylon and et cetera, et cetera. We see those nations are also, it's like, don't you get proud for me using you as a tool to discipline my blessed nation, Israel. I'm still over 
all nations. And that's another walk away this morning. We have to remember the God who's over Babel, who's, who's over Babylon, who's over Israel. Is he not over our current circumstance? Is he not over these nations that have fractured even more, that have split into hundreds and hundreds of nations? Today, yes, he is. So God will use these nations to discipline Israel, but they'll also be disciplined for their own pride until they recognize that only God is the one to be worshipped and not themselves. Here's another walk away. I think even for the nations, they're supposed to take note. If they pick up Genesis 11 and see God created all nations out of one, I want to read to you Daniel chapter 4. This is what Nebuchadnezzar's walk away is from his humbling. If you remember, Nebuchadnezzar thought to himself, look at this Babylon, and you remember what he says next? Which I have built. Look at this Babylon that I have built. And God humbles him. And at the end of his humbling, he says this, when my reason returned to me, I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and He does according to His will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay His hand or say to Him, What have you done? On a personal note, he says this, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. That's Nebuchadnezzar's takeaway from his humbling down to the mind of a beast and doing that for several years. So there's a a warning to Israel, there's a warning to the nations, but there's also a warning for us, right? We see this. There's a warning for us. And I I have to ask this morning, whose name, whose name are you living for? Whose name are you magnifying? Who is the legacy for? That word is used a lot these days, legacy, legacy, legacy. What's the legacy for? Is it for your offspring? Is it for those that would know you, those around you? Is it to be remembered hundreds of years from now? Of course, if you're a believer in Christ, the answer is the legacy is for Christ. The legacy is for His glory. So I must look at my life and say, what am I doing for my own glory? And where, where must I still run from pride? Run from pride. And remember that God will still deal with it, even if it's found in his children. Think about James 4, James chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, if you would turn there. Look at James 4. This is perhaps one of the most familiar texts in the New Testament on pride. James chapter 4. Let's just read 6 and 7. He's talking about an adulterous people that are friends with the world, but God, verse 6, but He gives more grace. But He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 7, submit yourselves, therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I just love that verse in chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives more grace. Where's that verse found? Right in the middle of calling out a proud and adulterous people. And that's, that's our God. That is our God who gives the grace to proud sinners like you and I. 
And if we embrace His plan in Christ and humble ourselves, He gives that lasting grace. He says He gives more grace. And this always brings, always brings abundant, lasting joy, present joy when we submit to God. The last thing we see in chapter 11 is what? Is God. God's there. God sees. God initiates. He's able to deal in a very powerful way with all of mankind. And yet, His sovereign and gracious plan will not and cannot be thwarted. That's a something to walk away with today is that even though man asserts, man is ambitious, God's will will not be thwarted. Praise Him for that. Let's pray. Our Father, we are indeed uh, in, our, in ourselves and left to ourselves we're a people that would go off track and as is said by Isaiah that all of us have gone astray. We have turned all to our own way and that's just, that's just what we do. That's, that's who we are, Lord. But by your grace, by your grace and your mercy, you have turned us away from our own interests And Lord, you have turned us back to you, and we praise you for that. And I pray, even this morning, Lord, that you would renew our hearts in that, that we would be renewed in the grace to be found when we turn and come back to you. Lord, save us from elevating ourselves, save us from our own pride, and save us uh, unto yourself, Lord, by your sovereign grace, and thank you for the mercy that you've shown not only at the moment of the Tower of Babel, but certainly in your perfect Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you and praise you for these things. We rejoice in them. We pray all of them in his name. Amen.